Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to our legal clinic. We call it the law. It's your legal lights and health law. I'm Samson Ladi Anyenini. On the 14th day of June, 1985, Ghana brought significant change to the plight, particularly of widows and their children. That law has been tested over this period, but it appears it does not solve the problems as comprehensively as expected. So there have been attempts to review the interstate secession law to bring it up to modern times. What are the new changes proposed to the interstate secession law. What you know from your JHS or JSS social studies as PNDC law 111. Don't go anywhere. We have the expert who knows this law in and out and the new proposed changes to it. We'll be right back. The 111 has indicated how the estate of a deceased person ought to be distributed. Right. First and foremost, the law deals with a situation where the, the one who died left behind one house. If you, the person left behind one house, the law is that the surviving spouse and child are entitled to that house as tenants in common. I repeat myself. Surviving spouse could end up with spouses. Mm. Surviving child could be children. So therefore, that's just a term for, because this is Ghana. I mean, a man could have three wives, four wives, five wives, but a woman can never have two husbands in Ghana. So the surviving spouse means that if the man died and had more than one wife, then all the wives together with all the children are entitled to that one house equally. You said it could be the surviving spouse, surviving child or children, surviving parents, and surviving customer successor. That's a priority according to the law. So why is it only the children and the wife who are getting, or the surviving spouse who are getting everything? No, that's not about it. I mean, that is to say, after that, right. that is to say, after the one house and the charters, every Everything else that the deceased owned, we call it the residue of the estate. The residue of the, an estate is everything that the deceased acquired in his lifetime besides the one house and the household charters. The law has provided a formula for the distribution of the residue of the estate. And when the law was made, well, the situation was too bad, but somebody had to create a formula. The formula is not perfect by way of experience, but I will just tell you what the law says. <laughs> of the entire estate, that is to say the residue of the estate, the law says that the surviving spouse is entitled to 316. In other words, the law provides a formula as if maybe it is easier for us to quantify it in money terms. Right. Because when we talk about residues, it could be all kinds of things. But for the purposes of the discussion that we're having, let's say we've given a value to the totality of everything that we call the residue. And the value of it is, let's say, 1,600 cities. Okay. The law says that of that value, the surviving spouse is entitled to 316. In other words, if it's 1,600, then the surviving spouse is entitled to 300 cities. Then the surviving children or the surviving child is also entitled to 916. That is 900 cities. Of the remaining 400 cities, the law says that if the deceased left behind surviving parents, then they are entitled to 216. That's one eighth of the residue of the estate. Then the other one, eight, listen carefully, mm -hmm. the law says it must be distributed in accordance with custom. 
A lot of people end up saying that it belongs to the family. The law does not mention family. The law says that it ought to be distributed in accordance with custom. And what the law does is not to stop people from doing what they want to do, mm -hmm. but it shows them the consequences of their conduct or their action. Because the law is that a man expects the reasonable consequences of his conduct. Okay. You, you must expect everything that you do. Mm -hmm. That's why we say maybe your freedom ends where someone's nose begins. Right. So for those who will not listen, for those who believe that they've got a right to do what they want to do, what they need to be told is that they have section 16A of PNS law 111 that criminalize that intent that they have. And, and so if it manifests, right. the chances are that mm -hmm. they will see a judge who will show them where, as we say in Ghana, power lies. Right. That's was Kweku Pintel speaking to me on the law um, not too long ago. And today, we have Sheila Minkampremo. She's Chair, Executive Council, Lawa Ghana. That's the women lawyers in Ghana. And she's also the, uh, with the Ghana Bar Association's Women and Minors Rights Committee. Thank you so very much for making the time this morning, uh, this afternoon, to educate us on the proposed changes uh, to be made to PNDC Law 111. Thank you for inviting me as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, after 36 years of operating this law, this law was seen as such a savior, particularly to widows and widowers, if you like, and their children who were often deprived of their inheritance upon the death intestate of a spouse. Why are we seeking to tweak it any further and completely replace it with a new law? Um, thank you very much. Um, as you indicated, in 1985, when the Intestate Succession Law, the PNDC Law 111, now known as Intestate Succession Act, was enacted, it was a very laudable law because we had had a lot of social changes by then, and there was a need to protect, particularly the nuclear family, the spouses, the children, etc. So this law was enacted to give them a share of the property of an intestate parent or spouse, et cetera, et cetera. As you also indicated, it's been in effect for 36 years. And with everything, however good it is, with time, some shortcomings are realized, you know, after reviewing it, after using it, and then it's good to then take a look at what those problems are and how to remedy it. In this particular case, the problems and the changes that are required were so substantial that it was decided that it's better to come up with an entirely new, you know, review the law totally instead of doing little amendments to it. So one of the challenges that was found, I think my senior colleague, um, Mr. Pintel, was, you know, you just showed a clip of him giving an overview of the law. One of the key things about it is the manner in which the property is supposed to be distributed. He has to take out one, one house and household chattels for the surviving spouse and children. The rest of the properties, which is known as the residue, is depend on the scenario of what the person left behind. If it's a spouse, their children, their parents, their family, it's shared in a certain way. There's this famous 16 parts. Then if there's only a spouse or only a child, there's also some um, fractional distribution. Over time, it's been found that it's very difficult to actually implement the, you know, the fractional distribution of the residue. Very, very difficult. And um, some um, researchers have indicated that then it leads to fragmentation of the estates. Okay? So you know, the fractions itself has become a problem. Right. Again, in, in Ghana, you know, he also mentioned that in his presentation. Um, we have three different laws under which a person can marry. Two of them are potentially polygynous. That means that a man can marry multiple spouses. You know, we have the, under the Marriages Act, it's in part one, part two, part three. Two of them, that is the one that's based on the, the Islamic law, is, it allows a Muslim man to marry up to four women. 
our own customary law has no limit to the number of women a man can marry. But if you look at the law, the way the provisions are, it appears as if it works on the presumption that, you know, it's one man, one wife, which is the monogamous type of marriage, which is a civil, now it's known as a Christian and other marriage under the Marriages Act. So you realize that, you know, there's some inequity in there because if four, um, four women marry to one man and that man dies, that one share which goes to the spouse must be shared by four different women. On the other hand, if all those women predecease the man, what happens? He stands to, to, to benefit from each of them in whole parts. So there's some elements of inequity. Mm. There are also instances where a woman who may be a spouse may not necessarily have a child with her, the spouse who passes away. So then the, you know, she, 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 you would see that whatever goes to her becomes really small. Because of course, if it's, if, a, if it's a woman is married to a man and they have children, and the children also benefit. It's, what goes around, you know, usually um, um, is a little much more, you know. So it was also one of the, the, the discussions was that um, maybe the share to the spouse should be such that where um, there's no child between them, then at least something a bit more substantial goes to the surviving spouse. Then the key thing is that in 1992, we had the... the, 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 the uh, a new constitution, which is the 1992 Constitution of the Fourth Republic of Ghana. Article 22 of this constitution has very two key important provisions. Usually there's a lot of um, um, discussions on the part to do with distribution of marital property. But the same law in the first part, if you look at 22.1, it indicates that a spouse shall have you know, a reasonable share of the properties of the other spouse, whether or not the person died living a will or not. So um, yes, the argument is that PNC 111, as it is, even sort of partially satisfies it. But then the argument is that some of the problems with it sort of, you know, lots of shortcomings. So even though it satisfies it, um, the text of the law itself doesn't take recognition of people's equitable interests. I mean, when you have a legal interest, that's easy to pursue. But if you have an equitable interest, it's much, much more difficult. So there was a need to ensure that the text of um, Article 22.1 is also reflected in the same um, interest, um, the interest of succession law. Mm. So that's one of the key things that have been done. Right. He also mentioned something about the interpretation of the share that goes to the family. I think there's a case which went all the way to the Supreme Court where the family presumed that the share that goes to the family is just the family. But the law, I mean, in the, the Supreme Court emphasized that it is the family that would have inherited through the proper lineage system. So there was also a need to try to clarify that issue as well. Then mm. the punishments in the law. There's, um, the, there's some punishments in, in, in the intensive succession law as was amended, but people thought that the punishment was not strong enough. So people were just violating um, the provisions of the law. Right. Then he also mentioned the value of the property. It was kind of fixed. It took a long time before it was increased. And of course, the value of what the, the residue is now is so low. So there was also a need to put it up. So quite a number of all these um, little shortcomings really required some key changes and the drafting section decided that it was better to come up with a comprehensive new law to replace the intensive succession law. That's it. The comprehensive. Uh, if you just joined us, you are on the law. This is our legal clinic where we try to surgically go through the law and provide you solutions. So it is your legal light and it's your, your help law. And our guest uh, this afternoon is Sheila Minka Premo, taking us through the proposed interstate secession bill uh, to replace the law that we have operated for 36 years now. She had just laid out the challenges with the law or the deficiencies with the law that require substantial tweaking. One, so we may begin with, and as uh, Kweku Pinto was going through how the distribution ought to be done, I, I very easily, you know, recognize the difficulty. And when you took us through this law at the... Uh, conference, Ghana Bar Association Conference in Boga, many lawyers were excited about the proposal to replace 
the 3 16th, 9 16th, 1 8th, and all those stuff with percentages. Explain that to us. Thank you very much. So like I said, as a practicing lawyer myself, I, I, when people come, after you've obtained this administration and they come and ask you how are they supposed to distribute, it's a big um, challenge. So as I said, the fractions was difficult for most of us who are very bad at maths in the first place. <laughs> so the, 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 the drafters decided to replace the fractions with ratios, okay, which are sort of polar numbers. So for instance, um, where a person is behind a spouse, child, um, and then what, parents or whatever. Um, basically, now, instead of the, the remaining being with the residue, after taking one house and household shuts allows, instead of the residue being divided into 16 parts, where one the spouse gets three over 16, and then the children, nine over 16, and then the rest of the family and their parents. Now, the same principle, you know, after the rest residue, you take out um, one, one. In this case, it's not just one house. The law says that where there are more than um, one house, more, more properties go by. Once the spouse can take one house, the children also take one, and then the remainder, which is the residue, is then shared as follows. 35% to the surviving spouse, 45% to the surviving ch child or children, 15% to the surviving parents, and 5% in accordance with customary law. And where there's no surviving parents, then the residue of the estate sort of changes. It becomes 45% to the surviving spouse, and 45% to the surviving child, and 10% in accordance with customary law. So you can see that this is a vast change from what um, used to be. Where um, then the law, um, the, you know, the, the, the bill, the, I'm looking at the 2018 bill, because that's the last. There have been four bills before which all lapsed, but the 2018 one is the last one that lapsed. So that's the one that I'm looking at. Section six of it then goes on to say that where the intestate is survived by more than one spouse. That means if it's a polygenous union where the man has multiple um, wives, then the percentages change. Then it becomes 50% of the surviving spouses. That is a bit higher than where there's only one. 40% to the surviving child, then 5% to the surviving parents, and then 5% in accordance with customary law. So slightly more is added on to the share of the spouse. Then there's also another interesting provision. There's a, there's a mixed provision of what they call um, the interest of an estranged spouse. You know, sometimes people have problems in their marriage um, for whatever reasons, whether religious or Christian reasons or whatever, they just sort of separate for a while. Or sometimes somebody may even have started um, some matrimonial proceedings, but it takes quite a while before it gets done. And people have concerns about such um, spouses coming to benefits fully when the other spouse dies. So section seven of the law has this interesting provision. Um, it says that where, spouse, where spouses are estranged, then the judge shall exercise a discretion as to what percentage of the estate to give to the estranged spouse, which in any case shall not be less than 30% on the death intestates of the other spouse. And then for the purposes of this act, a estranged spouse means a spouse who has not lived in the same house with the other spouse for a period of not less than five years and who is no longer, who no longer has a normal relationship with the other spouse. So that's a very interesting provision, which right. is also an innovation, mm. which people are talking T about. Tell us, yes. the, tell us the intention behind this review, uh, that a spouse, uh, there's been a separation, but not a divorce. And yet that has persisted for as many as five years. And yet one party is entitled to benefit from the estate of the uh, de deceased spouse. Okay, thank you very much. Basically, you know, the law is, you know, normally when the, in the lawmaking process, there are lots and lots of discussions. I, just, I participated in some discussions, some were held with people from different um, sectors of the community, traditional rulers, women's rights groups, etc. And this concern about people who are um, sort of separated. And the typical scenario is that the person is not happy, and it's usually the woman, then, oh, 
she's going to stay, particularly abroad, to look after a grandchild or something. The person is really away for a while. Sometimes um, people say, as a, as a result of loneliness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, the man may have somebody else that he's sort of cohabiting with. If that person is married under the ordinance, as you know, however long he cohabits with that person, that person is not going to be um, benefiting anyway. Okay, but then the idea is that then that, that spouse who has been away for a very long time, not participating in the life of the other spouse, should not be entitled to the full, um, um, the full portion assigned to the surviving spouse. So let's reduce it a bit. It's a bit of a, for me, it's, it's one of the problematic parts of this law. Mm. Implementing this is a problem. And I'm sure that you also had a workshop. People raise issues that the provision itself is not wholly constructed because all it says is that the judge has a right to determine the, the, the portion that should go to such a person, and it shouldn't be less than 30%. But the law didn't go on further to give more directions to the judge in terms of um, the, 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 the portion of that person which is reduced. Mm. What happens with it? Is it going to be distributed mm -hmm. to the other beneficiaries or what? The law is silent on that. Mm. But I presume that because the law mentions the discretion of the judge, the presumption is that the judge will use his or her discretion to then redistribute that portion among the other beneficiaries. Mm. Maybe there'll be more children or whatever. So it, it's, it's the mischief is to, it's like a little punishment to people who really are not in the, has been separated. It's, if you look on the outside, you think there was no existing marriage, but it's just because of the legal ties, mm. that person is still entitled to something out of the estates because they are still legally married. Yes. That's, yes, it's the, the mischief. Right, that and, and that, that brings some sanity and equity, doesn't it? Because the estranged spouse may have contributed a lot to even uh, this particular property that has been made, and simply because they have been separated and not divorced, she's not entitled. And so this certainly is a good way to ensure equity in the system, is it not? Yes, yes, it does bring in some elements of equity, in mm. my view, yes. Now, it that, does. Now, that brings to mind the reference you made to the constitutional provision in Article 22. Um, the law says that there may be joint property, and joint property should be distributed equally, 50-50, between the spouses. So if, uh, between the spouse, okay, so if one predeceases the other and there is no will how is the distribution supposed to be made when the the surviving spouse already has is entitled to 50 percent of that property okay thank you very much several core parts of the bill i mean the various sections the various bills i've seen including the 2018 one makes provision for that if you look at section four, it sort of indicates that if the surviving spouse is a co-owner, then that portion that belongs to that spouse does not fall into the portion to be distributed. If you look at section four, for instance, it indicates that um, where the estate includes one house and the surviving spouse partly owns that house, the estates available for distribution shall not include the part owned by the surviving spouse, okay? It goes on further in section eight to say that when the intestate is survived by a spouse, the surviving spouse shall have a 50% interest or share in the matrimonial home. Then it goes on to say that same to H2 says that where the surviving spouse partly owns the matrimonial home, the estate available for distribution shall not include the parts owned by the surviving spouse. Then section nine even gives an option to buy out. It says that where the estate of the intestate consists of only one house, and the surviving spouse made a contribution to the acquisition of the house, the surviving spouse shall have the option to buy out the other beneficiary. So the taking in um, consideration of the provisions of Article 22.1, um, provisions have been made in the law to protect that interest. Mm. That's uh, very interesting that, because sorry. it does appear that generally um, people, families don't seem to pay attention to this when... Uh, there is death in test state. And particularly for women, they have to scramble 
for the portion that belongs to the women and the, the surviving spouse and children rather than what lawfully belongs to them, even which should be separated for them uh, and should not be included in the portion that has to be distributed, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So at least the provisions of the law makes it clear enough. I know that even under the existing law, mm. if you think you have an interest, you can actually go to court to fight it. Mm. But it's such a long process, right. etc. So the law's recognition mm. of this in its provisions immediately puts everybody you know, on notice that, hey, if this person is a co-owner, this is it. This part has been reserved and it's not part in the pot for distribution. Mm. So yes, it's really, really... And this brings to mind the Lands Act and the very innovative provision that has been put in there. Innovative yet controversial. Uh, that is to the effect that uh, when during the lifetime of the married couple, if property is acquired, it is presumed to be joint property unless a contrary, you know, intention has been expressed in writing. Um, yes. How does that impact on the interstate succession, you know, laws, distribution processes for property that there may not be express, express written, you know, uh, intention suggesting that it belongs to either the man or the woman? In my view, the same presumption that we see in the Lands Act should should apply. I mean, even though it's not stated clearly here, I believe that the same presumption should apply. One of the, I would say, a bit controversial provisions in this um, interstate succession law, which, you know, the, the good thing for us is that this 2018 one has lapsed. So a new one, updated, is going to be prepared. And I'm hoping that some of the discussions we are having will be reflected. If you look at the interpretation section of this um, law, um, that is in section 28. They have an interesting provision. They try to define jointly owned property. But, and then it's, it's defined as it means a property in which each of the parties made a substantial contribution towards the acquisition. And this is a bit problematic, okay? A, a bit, it makes it a little different from the land act, which raises a presumption, which then would have to be rebutted with, with, with evidence to the contrary. It's, it's, it repeats the word, parties made a substantial contribution. What does that mean? Okay. I mean, we are aware of the series of judgments coming from the Supreme Court, where um, how, particularly Article 22.3 has been interpreted in some instances, equity is equality, and there's 50 50. In other instances, the court would like to see the contribution of the actual of the actual contribution of the other spouse etc so for me this is one of the provisions that should be looked at again i think that the provisions in the land act which raises a presumption you know should also be reflected in the intention succession act to make it easier to apply otherwise the way they've defined jointly owned property in the intention succession law as it is now will become a problem right um the one question that comes up that we Ought to have cleared earlier um, you had clearly stated that by the uh, proposed bill uh, a wife who has been or a spouse who has been separated uh, for uh, for not more than five years is entitled to 30 percent not, not not less than 30 percent yes not less than 30 yeah. percent uh, does it mean that if the separation, the period of separation uh, exceeds five years before the one uh, is uh, disease, one is de one dies, then the straight spouse will not get anything? I think that the, 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 the actual provision says that the two should have been separated for not less than five. So it's rather the other way around. Mm. So that means that if they have been separated for four years, the person will benefit in the same way as every other spouse. But if they've been separated for over five years, it says not less than five years, and who no longer has a normal. So um, if the person, so basically it applies to those who've not sort of had a normal relationship, they've not, they've been separated for over five years. Then, 
you know, the, pet, the spouse will entitled to receive less. If it is below five, the spouse will still benefit as any normal spouse under the law. Okay, that's such a good clarity that you bring to bear on that uh, subject. And uh, we mm. are on the law. This is your legal light. It is your help law. And we are bringing you um, education on the proposed uh, interstate secession bill to replace the old one that we have operated for 36 years now. And we have the best with uh, the in-depth knowledge of the law assisting us with that education, and that is uh, Sheila Minka uh, Premo. Now, the, we will open the phone lines uh, soon, uh, and I'll, I'll allow you to join also via Zoom to put your questions, uh, seeking clarification among others on this new uh, proposal. You had suggested that one of the changes also has to do with the punishment, because presently the punishment uh, for violating the law is so low uh, that people don't really uh, are not bothered and they go ahead and violate the law. So educate us on that. Okay. Mm. So in the current in the draft in the in the 2018 version of the bill, they have actually enhanced the punishment. Okay. So um, you know in many parts of the law indicates that it's, it's wrong to, de to, to deprive someone who's entitled to a part of the property from their share or remove, destroy, or unlawfully interfere with the property, etc. It says that you commit an offense and you're liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than 700 penalty units, okay? Mm. And not more than 1,000 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not less than two years or no more than four years or to both. And the court shall make any orders that it considers necessary for reinstatement or reinvestment of the person who was ejected or deprived of property. So they've actually enhanced the punishment. Mm. As we know, one penalty unit is 12 Ghana CD. So if you multiply the 700 and the 1,000 by it, we know what it is. Yeah. And the so key that, thing is, is, that is 8,400 yeah. minimum and 12,000 yes. 12, Ghana CDs maximum. Yes. Or in and addition to like that, you could go to jail for two years. Yes. Mm. And also like the reinstatement and reinvestment. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I've taken it, I've spent it, so what can you do to me? Mm -hmm. Now the law says that they can ask you to also reinstate or also reinvest. Apart from the punishment of the fine or the imprisonment, you also have to actually reinvest or reinstate the person. Mm. Okay? Right. And it mentions other punishments. Mm. But, but, um, but let's go over this again. You said... What is this offense that attracts between 8,400 uh, and 2, uh, 12,000 or in addition to that, uh, imprisonment for two years and then also there can be reinstatement and reimbursement? What is the crime okay. that one commits to uh, get this kind of sanction? Okay, what the law says is that before the distribution of the estates of an intestate, unlawfully depriving the entitled person of the use of part of the property or property to which the act applies and which is shared by the entitled person with the disease, or removes, destroys, or otherwise unlawfully interferes with the property of the diseased person. Mm. You, I mean, from as a practitioner, 30 something years afterwards, we still have people coming to our office. As mm. soon as the husband dies, they come locking up the door, they come taking the private car to, to, to the family house. People are still doing these things. Right. So if you deprive any beneficiary, of any part or interfere, et cetera, et cetera, then you have violated in the law. There's another type, there are other types. Mm. Um, then um, if that's what I mentioned is in 25. 26 mm. talks about a person who before the distribution of the essence of an intestate locks up the property of the deceased or takes possession of household property within the matrimonial house. Mm. Home. You know, household property all belongs to surviving spouse and children. Right. So if you go and take any of that, you also commit an offense and an unsummary conviction to a fine of not less than 250 penalty units and no more than 500 penalty units. Also to a term of imprisonment of not less than two years and no more than four years. Mm. And then here too, the court can make an order for reinstatement and reinvestment. So the previous one is about interfering, mm. okay? Removing, destroying, unlawfully interfering. 
This other one is about locking up and taking possession of household property within the matrimonial home. Mm. Uh, the, so the 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 uh, the sanctions, as you, you you spoke about first, on the question of unlawfully ejecting or interfering with the process uh, with the property and all of that, the enhancement is to the effect that previously it was uh, upon summary conviction to a minimum fine of two and a half penalty units, and not exceeding two hundred and 50 penalty units. But now, it has been increased to 701,000. And previously, it was not exceeding one year of imprisonment. Now, it has gone to two years of imprisonment. So that's that's substantial, you know, uh, enhancement of the sanctions. It does, it does. Right. There's a bit of a confusion between 25 and 26. Like mm -hmm. I said, okay. 25 talks about 25 is headed offenses against spouse and entitled person. Mm. And then 26 is just other offenses. Okay. Mm. So um, it is 25 which talks about depriving entitled person and entitled person of the um, of, of the use of part of the property or removing, destroying, or unlawfully interfering. 26 talks about locking up the property. Mm. Okay. I guess right. the locking up and the, the punishment for that appears to be a little less. I mean, I don't see that. I think... There's, some, there's a need to harmonize the two somehow. Because if you lock up, you're also interfering. That's right. Okay? If I look at 25, removing, destroying, or otherwise unlawfully interferes with the property of the diseased person. Okay? Then 26 is a person who, before the distribution of the essence of an intestate, locks up the property of the diseased or takes possession of household property mm -hmm. within the matrimonial home. And then the punishment is, like I said, that one is 250 penalty units and no more than 500 penalty units, or term mm. of imprisonment of not less than 20, eh, sorry, two years, and no more than four years. Mm. And here, to the court can make reinstatement and reinvestment. Mm. So it's a matter of interpretation. The first one is targeted at the spouse, because most people know that those that um, family members really try to deal with first is the spouse. Right. So that's the, is a, is a and, target. And, 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 and as you mentioned, uh, previously, or the, I said previously, the present law, you, you, were, you were going to, if you were going to face jail, it will be not more than one year. Now, yeah. it is at least two years or not more than four years. Yes, two to four. But do you yes, think this is, still, four, yes. this is still deterrent enough? Hmm. Well, in, in some discussions we've had, people think that it should even be made even stronger to really serve as a full deterrent. Because this abuse, because this abuse or violation is very rampant, particularly very rampant. against women. It is very rampant. So for me, maybe if it's even further enhanced, you know, in the hopefully 2020, 2021 version of the law, mm. I think that it will be good because it's really very common, mm. you know. Right. Very common. It's the time when a person is most vulnerable. Mm. They've lost a spouse, they're vulnerable, and then the family comes at them. Right. So, so those of you who are watching us and uh, you know people or you yourself, you have been involved in this business of uh, being in a hurry to run to lock up, you know, the premises uh, of, uh, of somebody you say is your brother, particularly because a man is, you know, dead. Then you run as a family and you say, this woman, we don't even like her. We have issues with her or our brother even has matters with her or our son had issues with him and uh, uh, with her and therefore you go lock up uh, doors and premises and you begin to drive away cars and like she mentioned private cars which are supposed to be part of the household shuttle that belong to the surviving spouse and the children if you do these things and you interfere in any way with the property of the disease or the dead person you are in trouble if you hurry to eject the person, particularly women suffer this, you go and throw them out of the house, remember that you are looking to go to jail for a minimum of two years and up to four years. You will languish in jail. You could also be fined to pay uh, between 8400 and 12000 and then they will add the, the, the jail term uh, onto that. And then in addition to that, you will be asked, to reinstate the person, you know, 
and, and reinvest them. If you have used the property in any way to make money or something like that, you reinvest the people. So if you haven't learned anything this afternoon, this is what you have to take note of, it's particularly the families who are always in a hurry to go eject a woman because they are vulnerable and, you know, um, helpless sometimes in these situations. My guest is Sheila Minka uh, Premo, and she is educating us on the proposed interstate secession uh, bill, hopefully to replace the one we have operated for 36 years now. We will take a quick break, return to continue the education and enlightenment. This is your legal light. It is your help law. Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to My Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. You're welcome back. This is The Law. It's your legal light and health law. My guest is Sheila Minka Premo, Chair, Executive Council, uh, Lawa, uh, Ghana. And uh, a question is already in. I'd like you to take that before we continue. And it says, what about a spouse who walks out of the marriage unceremoniously or unannounced, leaving one to hustle through thick and thin? and comes back after five years to reap where he or she did not sow. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, basically, you know, if your spouse has walked out, as you literally indicated, without taking the appropriate steps to dissolve the marriage, and you are not happy, and as you say, you are struggling, the best thing is to take the steps to dissolve the marriage, okay? There are ways, I mean, depending on the type of marriage that you are, there are processes that you can follow for the dissolution of the marriage if you think that the person is totally cut off from you for that law. Because under the Matrimonial Causes Act, if you've been apart for two years, you can apply if the person you can apply to the courts for dissolution and if the person consents, they can the, the courts can grant divorce. Otherwise, if you've also lived apart for five continuous years, then once you apply to the courts, it's possible for the courts to dissolve the marriage. Under customary law, we all know the processes you are supposed to follow. There's a, a procedure. So um, there are ways in which, I mean, this law is just making a provision for the default position. Personally, whenever I'm talking about the intestate succession law, I always proceed it by saying there are two ways in which we all die. Either you die intestate or intestate, with a will or without a will. If you want to take control, um, make a will, indicate who you want, whatever properties you have to go to then that is what will apply when you die. If you don't, that is where the law has made provision for how the estate is supposed to be distributed. And it's done in such a way that the most vulnerable will be protected, or those who helped you to acquire your properties are protected and their interest taken care of. So that is what I would have to say about right. that. Right. And this question is coming from a lawyer. Uh, Fred says, uh, thank you for the good education. If a judge has the discretion to determine the portion of the estate of the disease that goes to an estranged um, wife, which should not be less than 30%, what happens in this scenario? A man remarries a second wife after the death of his wife and say in three months the man dies. It implies the spouse would have been married to the man for less than four months. Will it be fair that such a wife is treated as if she's been a wife from day one? Is it not the case of unjust enrichment? Secondly, since side chicks and baby mamas are now becoming prevalent, would the next revision of the bill consider them in the next, say, 2020 or 2021 bill? <laughs> Thank you very much. Interesting um, questions. On the first question, which talks about a man who's been married for a long time to his wife, his wife dies or is, um, is divorced or whatever, that he marries somebody within three months and the person dies. Too bad. Under the law, that person is your new spouse and that person would inherit. 
as to the labels you want to give to that person, it's just fate. Because I don't think the person came in with a plan to, to finish you off. Of course, if that is the person's plan and they, and they can prove some murder or manslaughter, or whatever it is, that's another thing. Mm. But so long as that person is the spouse, it doesn't matter how short the person is. Even within a month of marrying you, if it is God's plan that you should pass away, that person will inherit it anyway. All right. On the issue of the 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 the, the, the big question of whether the the the, the mothers of um, children who were never mm. married to the, the fathers mm. can benefit. Unfortunately, um, in this current draft, no provision is made for it. You recall that one other law which has gone sort of the, the two the, these two laws have all which are based on this Article Twenty Two have gone yes. side by side. That's the Texas Succession Bill mm. and the Property Rights of Spouses Bill. Mm. In an earlier version of the Property Rights of Spouses Bill, an attempt was made to make provision for um, cohabitants who have lived together for five years, etc. But that was strongly objected to. So in the last draft of the, of the Property Rights of Spouses Bill that I've seen, that has been totally taken out. Okay. Because the idea is that they said, if you look at Article 22, it talks about spouses. It doesn't right. talk about anything. Okay. But in this case... The children will benefit. Remember, the right. definition of children is children. Because Whether there's born no within illegitimate or outside, child. Right. That's mm. it. So the children will benefit, mm. but unfortunately, the baby mama will not benefit. All right. So the baby mama's and side chicks <laughs> is the chicks children's uh, interest that is taken care of and not yes. the uh, specifically. Yes. Um, I have uh, two uh, guys on the line. Um, hello, Charles. Be quick with your question. Hello, Mr. Ladi. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My question is, I think that I'm married to a woman, and then she leaves me. We are not, not that we are divorced, and she leaves me, and we were in a rented room. She leaves me to a place, and she stayed there for, let's say, six years. And with this six years, I'm able to raise some funds and put out some building. Upon my demise, will that wife of mine come back to benefit from what I Thank you. Thank you for the question, Charles. The next question I'll take is from John. Hi, John. Hello, John. We don't have John. Uh, can we address uh, Charles's question? Okay. So, from my understanding, you're, you're married to someone. She Things are not going well, so she leaves. She doesn't divorce, but she That's leaves. Right. They are separated for about six years. That's right. And then in that period, you built some property by, I mean, with your own resources, can she benefit? Under the, even under the current law, under the current Intensive Succession Act, so long as that building falls within your estate, yes, hmm. the, um, your, the surviving spouse has to share in it as well as your children. Right. Okay? He has to share in it, yes. Mm. Yeah. She and, cannot, that's, I mean, and that's, why, and that's <laughs> why you advised earlier that you take <laughs> the right step. If you have to divorce, go ahead and divorce. And all, uh, as it. it were, dissolve the marriage. If you don't That's dissolve it. it and you remain separated, the other party is entitled. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely um, right. Mm, yes. So I wanted you uh, to tell us uh, briefly what other interesting or, or what, what for you is the biggest takeaway in this law and why should it uh, in this bill and why should it be passed? Um, thank you very much. I think that the discussion we've had on the implementation um, or infusion of the provisions in Article 22.1 is very key. Um, and in terms of recognizing the equitable, legal and equitable interest of um, spouses in each other's property and this law taking cognizance of it. As you've already indicated, the, the, the Land Act has already gone far in making that presumption which can be rebutted. So for me, the recognition that this law or this bill is taken into consideration that um, the provisions of our um, esteemed constitution is, is very, very key. Mm. And it recognizes, um, you know, um, and then one key, other thing, the other thing I also thought was also important is that in some work, in some research I did some time ago under a project, um, the Legal Pluralism and Gender Project, from Sakrinya here, from Sakrinya here, did some research for us on in a Tesla succession law to also try to outline what are some of the problems. So one of the things was about many estates where there's a lot of properties to go round, but then the restriction in, in the Tesla succession law is one 
um, um, one, 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 one house and household chattels before the rest falls into the residue and the complicated system parts. So this law also recognizes that where there are several properties to go by, the spouse can take their own and then the, um, the children can also take theirs. Okay. And the interesting provision is that it's even indicated further that the, the, the spouse has a right to the first priority to choose the one that that spouse likes. Okay. You know? And then and then the children will come in. I mean, the key thing, mm. one of the things I like always whenever I'm doing advocacy on this is that the law itself is gender neutral. Mm. It is gender neutral. Male spouses benefit, female spouses benefit. The only reason why it appears as if it is more women who are going to benefit a lot is because of the gendered nature of uh, 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 this thing. And then the fact mm. that a lot of the discrimination when a spouse dies is it is it's when a male spouse women. dies mm. that the female spouse usually suffers. Great. Then uh, again, mm. the enhancement of the punishments is also very, very important because right. it's really, really tired of people who come to mm -hmm. you and then yeah. you have to refer them to yeah. the police, DOPSU. Mm. Fortunately for us, the DOPSU officers yeah. have also been tutored in some of these provisions. So they go... I agree with um, you. Very help. disturbing how some families can be so heartless uh, after, after a age. man dies. Yeah. That's um, it. And some of them are... Yeah, it's, it's so sad. <laughs> I, have, I yeah. have two callers on the line. Let's see if I, we can take them briefly. And then I would need you to tell us um, if 2009... We didn't pass the, the, the new bill into law. 2012, we didn't pass it. 2013, 2016, and now we have the 2018 one we are looking at. What's, what's, what's behind that? And why should this one succeed? Um, okay, let me pick the calls. Um, Osman. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, please go ahead quickly. I want to know, is there any arrangement with the NCCE so that if this bill is being passed into law, so that they can help educate especially family heads what has to benefit from this law? Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is. Yes, please. You are calling from the Kapim Mampong. If, if the property is a joint property and uh, maybe the woman walks away after five years, what happens to the woman? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so... Yes, Sheila, so uh, do you anticipate there will be a lot of edu education through NCC on this or Parliament's uh, subcommittee to do that before the passage? And then uh, the last thank question you. from Edith. Okay, thank you very much. I think you, you asked the question before we look at the questions from the, the state, mm. which is, you said, um, to, in two, two, you know, the first draft of the bill which went to Parliament was in 2008. Okay. Okay, so it's been to Parliament four times. Mm. And it all last. And the, the last time it went was in 2018. So currently, there isn't any new bill in Parliament per se. All right. Because remember, at, in 2020, everything that was there, um, I mean, by the time we did the election, everything... Um, it has to be started um, all over lapsed. again. Mm. It has to be started all over again. Mm. So the, in, in, in our, my presentation during the bar conference was that we are pleading with the, um, with the, with the Attorney General to reintroduce, look at, listen to us, Listen to people, strengthen the, the, the 2018 draft and come up with a 2021 one. We've already passed 2020, so right. it's 2020. We would like to see it. It's a very important bill, mm. and it's a law which, when it comes, it will really help people a lot. In terms of dedication, I know as a fact that NCC is gearing itself up to do a lot more, especially on these gender-related laws, etc. I think two weeks ago, they did a workshop on where they are coming up with the agenda policy. Mm. And I know I sat in, I was invited to sit in doing their validation. And they, I know one of the things they are going to do is to try to emphasize and make a special case to address issues to do with gender, particularly even the, some of the gender related laws and do more advocacy on it. I'd also call on um, a lot of civil society organizations. And basically what you are doing, mm. radio stations, Joy FM, taking up this issue itself is part of the advocacy mm. to let people know about it. and. All of us too should be on the lookout. There's usually, once the, the, the executive finishes with the law and it's laid in parliament, there's a call for a memorandum. Right. My group always, we have our ears on the ground. As soon as we hear, we always submit memos and they would call our parliament to call us so that we can also let our views be heard. All right. On, on Edith's issue, that's taking us, that's not talking about intestacy. It's talking about people who are still married, property is jointly acquired. You said the wife walks away and then, and what happens to it? Okay, 
when she walks before if you say she walks away does it mean she just separates or she seeks for a dissolution of the marriage if she just separates well if she decides to go for a dissolution of the marriage or divorce it is at that point that she has to talk about her interest That's right. so that whatever in, when there's any sharing she'll get her share that's right if she waits doesn't get divorced and waits until the other spouse dies and then she comes in yes if this law, I mean, well, of course, this mm. law we are talking about hasn't come mm. in yet. Right. But even under the existing law, right. she can really make a very big beeline. I mean, mm. it would go beyond just applying for legislative administration. She would have to bring an action against the administrators to get her share of the estate based on the interest that she has in Thank the estate. You. Thank you so very much for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, Sheila Minka Premo is Executive Chair. Uh, Lawa, that's the Women Lawyers um, in Ghana and also she is also uh, of the Women and Minors Rights Committee of the Ghana Bar Association and that's a committee she says that their eyes are always on these matters of gender in Parliament and as soon as they come up they make sure they follow them so we hope that this has brought you a lot of light and help this has been the law with me, Samson Ladi, and Yenimi. We're coming away again next week, God willing, same time.